Okay, it's cooking. That's interesting. Mac goes into like night mode. So anything that's up here is dark. So I can't actually see it unless I highlight over it. Interesting. Okay, so let's talk about the class for a few minutes. Um, okay, so this is 535. That's what everybody's here for. All right, so this is effectively an introduction, uh, introductory programming class. The assumption is you've never had programming before, even though I know a couple of you have, I assume you haven't. Is that a reasonably fair assumption? Yeah. Okay. Um, I'll, well, we'll get to that here in a few minutes. Uh, the book we're going to use for this class is actually an online text called Automate the Boring Stuff. Um, doesn't gonna, isn't going to cost you a dime. Uh, I will point something out here in a few minutes that if you wanted to buy the Udemy course that's related to it, you could. They have, I don't know, it's like 15 bucks or something like that. I won't reference it in the class, but if you wanted a secondary take on some of the stuff in the book as a, something to help you with some of the homework or whatever, I'm fine with it. it ultimately, it comes down to how you learn, but I'm not going to reference the uh, Udemy course, but the book does uh, talk about it. Uh, more importantly for you, uh, grade breakdown in the class. Um, we have uh, each week, uh, the Tech Talks is not going to, going to apply to, will it apply to the first part of this class? I will probably not require the Tech Talks for you. So pretend like this Tech Talk doesn't exist thing. Um, so we have Bible homework uh, due each week. Um, effectively look at this as free points. We're a Christian university. Uh, what I ask you to do is this semester we're going through the book of Luke. Each week you read two chapters from the, uh, uh, actually in this class you'll read four chapters from the book of Luke and write a couple of uh, sentences reflecting on it. What does that mean? I'm forcing you to read the Bible. Okay. Um, for 10% of your grade, if you don't want to do it, your max score is a 90. If you do do it, you're getting a free 10%. All right, so um, that's the, the punchline there. So that's what the uh, Bible homework's all about. The rest of the stuff is related to computer science directly. So we have uh, programming drill assignments and we have project assignments, and I'll talk about these. Uh, we will have a midterm and a final. These will both be online. I have a policy that if you do better on the final exam than you did on the midterm, I'll replace your midterm exam score with whatever you get on the final. Uh, so you can screw up the midterm and not screw up your grade is the idea. Um, so that's the high level grading thing for the class. Any questions on that? Make reasonable sense? Okay, so now here comes the part that somewhat sucks, let's say. Um, an eight week course is an absolutely horrific format to learn programming. Uh, yeah, not, not much I can do about it. That's the format of the program, right? We have eight-week courses. You meet once a week. Um, the issue, how many of you have programmed before? Okay. So if you've written some software before, it might not be as horrible, but I make, like I said, I'm making the assumption you've never programmed before. So maybe we'll be able to get through this stuff a little quicker. Um, but the way I teach computer programming is from the perspective that it's like a sport. Um, so let's take uh, uh, golf, for example. Um, let's say you've never picked up a golf club before and you go to some professional golfer and they give you a golf lesson to, you know, here's how to hit a pitching wedge 100 yards or whatever, something like that. Um, and they can just hit, they show you 10 of them in a row. They're just hitting it perfectly. You know, oh, this is the grip and all this stuff. And then what are you going to do? You're going to stand up and you're going to start swinging and missing and shanking it all over the place. You know, you can academically understand stuff, but until you've put the reps in and done it a zillion times, you're not going to be competent in it, right? So an issue with programming is in order for, I mean, I can teach you about variables and loops and conditionals and blah, 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 but until you've put in the reps doing it a whole bunch of times, you're not going to get any good, be any good at it. Um, now, having said that, when you take an introductory computer programming course, 
what do you expect to know when you come out? You know, if you think about it like karate belt or something like that, you start off as a white belt, maybe you're a yellow belt when you leave the class or something like that. You know, just enough to be dangerous, but not going and working as a professional software developer for a company or something like that. Um, but you still had to put a lot of time in to get to that point is the, uh, uh, the punchline. So with that in mind, I have all the assignments already up for the whole class. So if you wanted to get ahead and knock a bunch of them out, you can, but there is a lot of assignments that we need to cram into eight weeks. Some of them are very small. So even though they feel like, oh, it's an assignment, like it might be hello world, some of them are less small. So it's uh, uh, try to use time management. I'm going to pace the class the way the assignments are paced. All right, so if you uh, come down here, I think the easiest way to see it is under course tools. Uh, course calendar, and I have to switch up something here real quick. Okay, yeah, so for instance, a week from today, you have drill homework one, drill homework two, project one, Bible homework one, Bible homework two, and Bible homework three all do. Now, that's actually one of the easy weeks. Okay, so the three Bible homeworks, no big deal. You know, knock those out. The first couple of programming assignments are pretty easy, so this isn't going to be actually that big a deal. Uh, we are going to be talking about setting up a Linux environment um, uh, today, though. So part of what you'll have to do for next week is also get a Linux virtual machine environment set up, ready to do some software development, and that'll make some sense here in a, in a few minutes. All right, but if we fast forward here. Um. Maybe. I would say no, for because I want you to go through the experience of going through the virtual machine. Um, if you have a lot of uh, experience with Unix, I'm fine with you using the Unix portion of the Mac, but generally speaking, I'm going to have everybody use um, a version of Unix called, Unix called Raspbian um, uh, because it's relatively lightweight, won't overburden your machines, and already has all the programming tools and stuff built into it. Um, it's kind of also in a class like this, since technically we're, you're not necessarily going to school to go become a software developer. You're going to school to be IT professionals, which doesn't mean not programming. It just means that that's not the only part of your job. Working with virtual machines is something that's super common in uh, industry today. So having some experience working with it, knowing the pitfalls is important as well. All right, but we'll talk about that as we go through tonight. But how big is who? I think the download is, uh, you know, maybe uh, 600 megabytes or something like that, but it will run in one gigabyte of RAM. So you don't have to give tons of resources to it. Yeah, well, it's going to be a problem. You might have to dual boot. Yes, yeah, so you can, you, instead of running it in a virtual machine, you can just install it on there and dual boot. You know, with, uh, you want a Mac? Yeah. You only have two gigabytes on a Mac? Is it an old Air? There's no way you have two gigs of RAM in a MacBook no, no, Pro. No, not a RAM, like uh, a disk space. So oh, two gigs of disk space. Yeah. Oh, available, you mean? Yeah, that's what I mean. Oh, oh well, you can, get an X, you can get a jump drive or something to run off of. Or just get rid of some of your music. Put it on an external drive or something like that. Just, just figure it out, dude. <laughs> I'm thinking you're saying I only have two gigs of RAM. It's like, oh, I'm almost out of hard drive space. No, I don't. I don't care. So it's, it's 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 a thing. You'll be you'll be fine. All right. So as you see here, we only meet uh, once a week for eight weeks, and then we're done. So we're cramming a lot of stuff into uh, that period of time. And the farther in we get, the bigger the assignments get. But hopefully, the better you are at programming. As I said at the beginning, not the best way to learn computer programming. So it is what it is. All right. Um, so we'll start working through this stuff today and talk about uh, the high levels of um, programming. Just to give me an idea of my audience. So most of you rose your hand when you said you've had computer programming experience. What kind of experience have we had? What have you done with computer programming? Okay. 
doing what kind of stuff? Um, it's a, a doctor's program. Okay. All right, so would you say you are intermediate, beginner? Where would you put your... Uh, All right, you don't have a lot of confidence. Not a lot. Okay. Yeah. All right. Um, I work as a network user. I use Python uh, scripts to automate some uh, stuff on our server. Uh, mainly do, these were not totally my scripts. I knew the basics, so I put myself also between the beginner and intermediate, and I transferred Okay, so usually you were starting off with somebody else's base and then yeah. doing some modifications to get it to pull uh, off what you needed to do? Yes, and sometimes I wrote my own script, but they were not that um, okay. advanced. All right. Um, my okay. Okay. Sure. but you're comfortable with Python? Okay, so you, chances we're gonna be using Python in here, so um, chances are you'll be a little ahead of the curve, but you know, that, that'll be okay. Um, but, well, I already know, you. I had him as an undergrad, it didn't go well. <laughs> I worked, <laughs> I worked with Java, okay, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> beginner, beginner or less. All right, and you had undergrad here as well, right? Yeah. Where would you put your programming skill? Beginner. Beginner. All right. Well, I'll treat you all like beginners. That's fine. <laughs> um, okay. So let's just so let's just go down this path. All right, so I do record all my lectures, and I also put the slides up on um, uh, Blackboard. So you'll have a, a link to a playlist on YouTube for all the lectures. Uh, some people have said it helps them put them to sleep at night. Um, but uh, it'll be up there if you want to go back and review stuff. Uh, one thing I will try to do is make the class as interactive as possible. So after we kind of get through some of this beginner stuff, uh, because there is so much assignment things, uh, what I might actually do in class is work through some of the assignments and get you to maybe halfway points or something like that. Um, uh, because I do want to, I want the class to be fun, but I also want you to come out the other end with, you know, a reasonable um, background in it. And we're not just learning programming in here. I mean, so something you said I think is pretty interesting when we think about the IT world. Um, you know, when I think about uh, computer science versus IT, uh, there are different sides of the same coin. So computer science is about 75% creating new things, usually writing software to, to make something. And then 25% of the time, using something that's already been created. If I'm making a mobile app, maybe I wanna put Google Maps into it. Well, I'm not going to invent GPS for my app, right? I'm gonna bring Google Maps into my app, somebody else wrote that, and I'm gonna drop it in there, so I'm using somebody else's creation as part of my creation. So 25% of the time, I'm using somebody else's stuff. In the IT world, it's the flip. 75% of the time, you're using other people's stuff. Windows Server, Linux, whatever. And then 25% of the time, you have to create something. It's usually in the world of programming, and it's usually something with scripts or something like that where you're creating, a lot of times, you're creating the connection pieces where you're telling this machine how to talk to this machine because they don't know how to talk to each other on their own. Or this piece of software to talk to another piece of software, you have to write that integration piece. All right. Now, what I've always found interesting is uh, historically what we've had is folks who go into IT sometimes go into IT to dodge computer programming because they have this mentality that um, IT means not programming. I would actually make the argument, and one of the reasons we're using Linux in here um, is you know, to maybe make you feel a little uncomfortable. How many of you have used Linux before? Okay, a couple of you. All right, so uh, is... When you're programming in the IT world, a lot of times you're not using 
the fancy programming tools that full-time programmers might use with like .NET, with you have know, nice Visual Studio set up and everything's drag and drop and you wanna you know, get something from the database, you click a couple buttons, it generates the query for you. You, know, you have all these things that are all nice where if you're doing something in the IT industry, you might be SSH'd into a router that's sitting underneath uh, you know, a building somewhere with just a, you know, a terminal sitting in front of you and you're using some command line text editor to write some script and it's, it's not comfortable. You know, you don't, you don't have these power tools that you're having to, you know, that allow you to, to do that at a comfortable level. Does that make sense? So I might argue that maybe the types of applications you write are maybe less algorithmically interesting. But that doesn't mean, I mean, as an IT professional, our whole job is about automation, right? You're trying to make systems do the heavy lifting for us. And if we look at the title of the book here, Let's see, where am I at here? Is this the right class? Course book. Automate the boring stuff with Python. All right, so we're gonna go through this and a lot of it is how do I solve problems in my regular life automating things. Hopefully, some of this stuff you haven't necessarily been exposed to in your lives as a, a programmer. You know, we're gonna try to knock out the basic stuff pretty quick since everybody's had some computer programming background. Um, but pretty quickly we get into things like pattern matching with regular expressions. Uh, who's worked with regular expressions in here? Okay, a couple people. Um, uh, file IO, uh, she definitely did file IO heavily when she had her CS. Um, it's funny, we don't do file IO anywhere near as much as we used to in computer science. Now it's all talking to databases and things like that, but that's interesting. Um, web scraping, have you done anything with uh, you know, grabbing something from an HTTP request and you have a whole bunch of HTML code and you're gonna pull stuff out of it? So you know, hopefully there are some practical things in here that even if you've done things with programming in your careers are things you haven't necessarily done with and maybe is something you'll do on the side. Um, you know, dealing with spreadsheets, PDF documents, Word documents, um, that kind of stuff. So we're gonna attempt to get through all this stuff and if we just get to the end and it's just not reasonable, we'll just decide where to cut the fat. But, you know, it's grad school. You know, my assumption is you don't have a life outside of this class even though I realize that's the case. <laughs> it's not, that's not necessarily the case, but you know, it is what it is. Uh, but hopefully it's, uh, you enjoy it uh, more than it destroys you. Um, all right. So, in any case, let's just start going uh, through this. So, one thing that will be helpful for you, and this is throughout our entire program, so not just for this class, but the computer science department here uses a Slack channel. Um, so, you can sign up with your CUW email address. So, if you go to cuwcs.slack.com, you can sign in with your uh, email address. And I already have a uh, channel set up for 535, so you can go into that channel and ask questions, I'll post things. If you're working on homework assignments and you are having an issue debugging something, put the code in there. Um, and uh, you know, between me and the rest of the class, hopefully you can get uh, through it. Uh, the other thing I'll point out is, as far as like homework assignments go, I don't mind if you work in groups, to be honest. Uh, I ultimately want you to learn the stuff. I'll find out on the exams if you're not learning it, all right, uh, so uh, if you wanna work in teams and you know, get together and even turn in the same assignment for everything, that's fine. Um, I want you to learn, but don't be that person who just shows up and says, give me your homework, and you turn it in, and then you get a zero on the midterm and the final. I promise you, a zero on the midterm and a zero on the final, that's 30% of your grade, that doesn't turn into the B that you need to get in the class. Get it? <laughs> All right, so, uh, and my exams are programming, um, not multiple choice, true, false. You can't accidentally pass my exam. You know, typically the grades in my exams are either high strong A's or low weak F's. Every now and then you get a couple of C's sprinkled in there from like the accidental moons aligned or something like that. Uh, I also grade on competence, not on perfection. So on an exam, 
for example, if you, you know, uh, have a little tiny bug in your in your code, you know, because you're writing this with time constraints, right? You know, you have a little tiny bug in your code, but largely it's clear that you understood the problem, you solved it. I'm not taking off points for some stupid little, you know, you've had a comma somewhere, or forgot a semicolon, or you know, something like that. Something that the interpreter or the compiler would have pointed out to you and you would have fixed it very quickly. I'm not looking for perfection, I'm looking for competence. But I've been teaching programming for 20 years. It's usually very obvious when you're not competent. So this isn't a hard task when you know I see somebody's uh, uh, exam or something that just has like a curly brace and the word int in there somewhere and they want partial credit. Um, you know, the rest of it is just gobbledygook. That's pure incompetence. So you're not getting any points for that. I won't waste my time grading it. Um, so that's the punchline. I don't sit around looking for cheaters or anything like that. Uh, I want you to have a good experience and I want you to use as many resources around you as you can, but those exams are where I'm going to find out how well you've learned the material. And like I said, I have a policy. If you do better on the final than you did on the midterm, I'll replace your midterm grade with whatever you got in the final. Okay, so if you come in and you bomb the midterm, and well, that's going to tell you I'm not learning enough from this homework. Is that because I'm not doing it myself? Is that because I've fallen behind? Whatever it is, you can remedy that and fix it by the time of the final. That makes sense? So you have every opportunity to, to succeed by the end. Um, one thing I will point out, though, is uh, make sure you listen to each of your faculty members as you go through the program, because not all the teachers are going to like openly tell you to work on homework in teams, things like that. So don't just assume that's the department policy. Make sense? I'm a little different, so it's uh, um, maybe that's a good thing, maybe it's a bad thing. but. Uh, uh, I want you to learn, and however you need to accomplish that is great. All right. Uh, questions about any of that stuff so far? Okay. So let's uh, dive in. Now, my intention is to take something like a 30-second break every hour. <laughs> I'm thinking maybe a little more like a five to 10 minute break roughly every hour. So sometimes I get off on a roll. So if we start hitting the uh, around the hour mark and somebody's really got to pee, just start, or if you just got to get up and go, just go. But try to war let me know like, hey, we're around the hour and I'll, we'll stop the video and take a break and come back. I don't want to destroy you either, but sometimes I get in my own little world up here. It is interesting when I first started teaching years ago, uh, I had trouble filling like a 50 minute period. You know, you sit there and you write all your notes out and you know, you go through it all like turbo speed, right? You know, and then you got like 27 minutes left in a 50 minute class. You know, same thing when you give like speeches, right? You, you get up, you give your speech and you think you went for 20 minutes, you went for two. <laughs> now I'm cruising past 10 p.m. So you guys are probably gonna tell me to shut up at 10 p.m. Um, Interesting, I guess. All right, so most of you rose your hand uh, when I said, have you, uh, well, several of you rose your hand when I asked how many of you have used Linux before, right? Um, how many of you have heard of Linux? Assume all of us in here have at least heard of Linux, right? Okay, so uh, what, is, what is Linux? If you had to just give me a quick definition of Linux, what would you say? Okay, it's an operating system. Free. I heard open source. What does it mean for something to be open source? Uh, uh, who uh, locks the computer? Who? Uh, who locks the computer if you don't have access to it? Oh, from my account? Yeah. All right, I'll uh, message you on Slack real quick. All right, um, so what does it mean for something to be open source? Uh, 
Mm -hmm. Yeah, so open source doesn't necessarily indicate they'll let you change their source code for their project, but it means that you have access to the source code to do with what do with it what you want. Um, a lot of them have licenses associated with it where you can't like resell it or something, but you can contribute to the open source community, whatever. Okay. Um, now, what is an operating system? What's, what are some examples of operating systems you've worked with? Windows. Mac OS, okay, iOS, Android. All right, so all of these would be called distributions. This as opposed to operating systems. What's the actual operating system for Windows? Historically, the operating system that drove Windows was DOS. Um, that was so, you know, well, originally DOS was the operating system and the distribution. Um, so if we just real quick, when we talk about distribution, we're really talking about the core operating system plus the common applications we expect to be there day one. A text editor, a web browser, you know. Yeah. So that's your distribution of the operating system. Okay, operating system itself being the thing that allows the human being to interact with the hardware, but we do that in terms of user applications. So we expect that distribution to come with a whole bunch of user applications already piled in there. Um, early days of Windows, what we had, uh, DOS was both the operating system and the distribution. We get to Windows 3.1, Windows 3.1 was a windowing application, a user application that allowed you to have graphic user interface uh, with you know, a whole, you know, you had Notepad and Minesweeper and, you know, all the necessities. <laughs> um, but that ran on top of DOS. Eventually that evolved uh, through Windows 95 and you had uh, the uh, core operating system from Windows 95. Once it was no longer DOS, anybody know what it was called? When they started emulating DOS. So there was a point in time where when you opened up the command prompt on Windows, uh, we're getting there, yeah. So Windows NT is actually what's the driving force for your, uh, uh, well, it's the NT kernel is the operating system on modern Windows. But before that, we had the 9X kernel. So the 9X kernel. So whenever you see the word kernel, that's usually the synonymous with operating system. Okay, so you had something called the 9X kernel, and that was the... Windows 95 core operating system, which was an emulated version of DOS. All right, because Windows 95, what it brought to the table that earlier operating systems didn't was multitasking. Something we take for granted today. Windows 3.1 didn't support multitasking. First version of iOS didn't support multitasking. Current version of iOS barely supports multitasking. It does it in a very weird way. How many of you are iOS users in here? Who's, nobody else is an Android user in here? Interesting. So I was an iOS user for years, and my wife's still an iOS user. I'm Android now, my company writes software for both of these. Um, but the, the funny thing related to this is, if you look at the early commercials for Android, they would always talk about how they have multitasking, they support Flash, you know, all these things that Apple didn't do. Um, you know, so usually in a class, I'll ask my students, well, how many of you appreciate the fact that your Android phone supports, supports Flash? You know, a couple of them's like, oh, well, uh, yeah, I, I think it's good. It hasn't supported Flash in like seven, eight years. You know, they quietly stopped bragging about it as they removed it. It's not that Flash is inherently bad, it's that Flash is a, is a battery hawk. If you put Flash on your laptop and unplug it from the wall and go onto like Yahoo Games or something like that, your battery will just die. A laptop is supposed to be, get 10 hours of battery life, will get like 45 minutes. Just running flash. It's just a, a, a resource intensive application. Um, same thing with multitasking. The early days of uh, Android, all the commercials said, hey, we support multitasking. Uh, and iOS couldn't. If you, if you remember, if, how many of you have been using an iPhone since it like first came out? first iPhone, before the App Store, even the first year of the App Store. You wanted to listen to music, all you could have open was Pandora, 
If you wanted to check your email, Pandora stopped playing music, you could only have one application running at once. Multitasking didn't exist, right? But Android, it did. That's better, right? Well, what operating system is Android built on top of? Uh, Linux. Linux. Isn't Linux a good operating system? It is. It's great. It is. So wouldn't you assume that Android's multitasking model built on top of Linux would be a great multitasking model? Yes, but I would think iOS is also built on, on Unix. It's built on Unix, but they disabled multitasking purposely. Why? Oh, that's a good question. Why? What were the biggest complaints from Android users in the early days of Android? So they would sit there in the corner and brag that, oh, I have multitasking. Right, we support Flash. And then you have those stupid commercials where they can share playlists, right? You know. What was the biggest problem? What was the thing that Android users didn't want to tell you about? The phone was slow. Uh, Could be slow. Dry yeah, battery life. Yeah. yeah, you want to get the same battery life as an iOS device? You better hook a car battery in your backpack, <laughs> right? Because you got like 15 minutes of battery life. Why? Because of multitasking and secondarily because of Flash, but mobile Flash never worked very well anyway, so people didn't even use it. So let's not even call that a thing. But you, with multitasking, you got crappy battery life. But we just said that it was based on top of Linux multitasking model, which is great. But Linux's multitasking model assumes one very important thing, that you're plugged into a wall outlet. Not that you're running around with a tiny battery in your pocket. Flash, the thing before HTML5 that allowed you to have like little games oh, instead of web page. Okay, okay, got it. Yes. Um, but uh, um, yeah, so Android's multitasking model was built on top of Linux, which assumed that you had infinite battery life. It's great, as long as you don't have a battery. <laughs> so that was a problem. Apple later on came out with their own like multitasking model which actually what it does is they've identified like eight things you might want to do in the background. So as you close Pandora, that application could choose to hook into the operating system's audio feed and continue to play music in the background. The whole application is not running in the background, just that component of the application. Does that make sense? So that is a mobile-centric multitasking model. Um, so you kind of look at the history of uh, the, the, you know, these different platforms and Apple historically has been late to the game with some things, but I would say more often than not for good reason. Um, where, uh, I mean, Apple was first to the game with the, the smartphone, you know, iOS interface. And so part of what happened here was Android had to rush something. Google had to rush Android out to compete, right? And Microsoft never competed. That's why they fell off the face of the earth on that side of things. But, you know, it is an interesting thing when you perceive something as a, a, a benefit when it's actually a hindrance. You know, we today, we wouldn't necessarily think about the fact that we can't check our email while at the same time listening to music on our smartphone. But for a long time, that was the only way to pull it off without killing your battery. Make sense? Um, yeah, so... You know, I got off on a little tangent there, but, um, you know, in any case, it's all related to this. And actually, all the stuff I'm talking about here is really supporting material to give you a, a foundation because I don't want to build a um, programming foundation on top of quicksand. And I also want to, um, like I said, assume you haven't had programming before uh, because even if you have, there's probably some gaps in your knowledge that I want to fill in those foundations. If worst case, you come out of this class with a strong programming foundation and we only get through half the assignments or something, we'll call that a net win. Um, so in any case, we had this 9X kernel and uh, that was for Windows 95, Windows 98. What came after Windows 98 on the consumer side? So we had Windows 95 and you had Windows NT4 were out at the same time. The NT line, the new tech, that was an NT 3.51 that came before that, but the NT line was their business application, a business operating system. So Windows NT, and this is where people, um, uh, yeah, so this is where people really got screwed up. This is a funny one. <laughs> 
This is consumer history. So we had DOS. Then we had Windows running on top of DOS. So we'll call this Windows 3.1. There was a Windows 1 and a Windows 2, but let's just call that guy. Then we had Windows 95. Now, right around here, we had Windows NT 3.51, and we'll, we'll color code this guy yellow because that's their business operating system. So then you had Windows 95, and you had Windows NT4. Windows NT4 was running the NT kernel, which was a brand new kernel, brand new operating system, not something that was still based on DOS. Okay, brand new operating system. And NT4 was running on top of that, but it had the Windows 95 user interface, which everybody loves. So we still effectively have the Windows 95 user interface today. We're going to be looking at Raspbian Linux today, which effectively has the Windows 95 user interface. Instead of clicking a button that says start, you click the little raspberry. That effectively is a start button. <laughs> it shows you the stuff that's in the OS. That's the way we use operating systems today, right? You know, and an interesting enough thing is that, uh, uh, you know, you talk to Mac folks, and they talk about how great the Mac OS is and things like that. My experience is you put the Mac OS in front of Grandpa, he has a lot harder time using a Mac than he does with Windows. You know, I come over here, where do you start? I don't see a start button, I just see stuff. Start clicking around, whatever. Um, you know, reason I use a Mac is I write for all these different platforms. I write iOS apps and, well here, I'll, we'll just pop it up real quick. Um, so, do you know anything about machine specs? This is a eight core Core i9 processors with 64 gigs of RAM in it. I have a lot of resources here for running multiple virtual machines. So one computer here gives me like 10 computers. Um, so it's the right machine for me. Computer is a computer. Either one will get you to work. You can drive a Ferrari, you can drive a Chevy. <laughs> or you can drive a Chevy and then take several vacations. Um, but yeah, so I've always found that funny how, um, you know, uh, Mac folks, We'll talk about how great their user interface is and some of that, where I just don't, I don't know how that is that easy to use. I think people find it significantly easier to just pick up Windows and start using it. I've always found that interesting. Um, yeah, so Windows 95 was still effectively based on DOS. You know, at some point in there, they called it the 9X kernel and we're emulating the old school DOS. But starting with Windows NT 3.51, this was Microsoft's first real operating system. Before that, DOS was something they picked up off the street, right? Microsoft didn't write DOS. In fact, it's probably the most, uh, anybody know the story of how DOS came about? Well, yeah, they bought it, they didn't take it. Yeah, it's probably one of the most uh, uh, profitable meetings in history. How many of you have heard of a company called IBM? Yeah, I've heard of IBM, little company, right? But back then it was the cool kid. Microsoft today is like the IBM back then, right? Google's kind of like, you know, they're the cool kid now, or they may be becoming a little bit less cool, but you know, you get what I'm saying, okay? But back then, IBM was the cool kid. Well, Bill Gates, we've heard of Bill Gates, Microsoft dude, right? You know, walks into this meeting with IBM and says, hey, you know, this is at the time when, you know, personal computers were starting to sort of kind of become a thing. Um, and, uh, uh, you know, affordable enough, but they were usually sold as kits where you can kind of, you know, it wasn't what we think of today as a personal computer, right? It wasn't just plug and play. But, um, you know, they go into this meeting with IBM and they said, you know, IBM, you, you guys want to get into this personal computer market, right? You know, but this time people don't know if it's going to take off or anything like that. And I mean, IBM says, yeah, we do, but, you know, we, you know, we're, and Microsoft's like, well, you need an operating system to drive your hardware, right? Well, Microsoft said, this is, this, is, this is where Microsoft made their zillions, 
he said, we want to license our operating system to you on a per machine basis. Now, if, so they created the idea of software licensing. If you're IBM, you're sitting there and say, well, we're not sure how many of our machines are actually gonna sell. And this guy here is telling me we only have to pay them when we sell a machine? That sounds like a good deal, right? IBM's famous, famous quote, no problem, real money's in the hardware, quote. Okay, so they shook hands, pretty good deal, right? One big, big, big problem. You know, how many of you ever played uh, poker? Cards, you heard about bluffing, right? You, know, you pretend like you have a better hand than you have. What was the major problem with that meeting? Bill Gates just made this great deal. He didn't have an operating system. Yeah, we'll license you our operating system on a per machine basis. Now we have to go find one, right? So he bought DOS for something in the ballpark of like 50,000 US dollars. And it was some hobbyist had made DOS. He ran an electronic shop or something like that. And, uh, you know, so some guy comes off the street and says, hey, I hear you have an operating system. And the guy, oh, yeah, this is just my little hobby thing I did in my basement. Um, and some guy offers you 50 grand off the street for your hobby software. What do you say? You say yes, right? So that's what happened. And that was DOS. So DOS, the foundation of all these operating systems, was not ever even written by Microsoft. You know, we keep fast forwarding past Windows 95, we have Windows 98, okay? And this guy is still based on top of a rendition of DOS. Okay, what came after Windows, uh, well, actually, hold on, so or this is where things got really confusing. You had a lot of ticked off people at Best Buy back when Best Buy sold software. What was the next operating system that came out on the Microsoft side of things? Windows 2000, which column do I put it in? It sounds like it should be the blue column, but Windows 2000 was an NT-based operating system. So a lot of people went and bought Windows 2000 to upgrade Windows 98. Now, Windows 2000 was a great operating system. In fact, you probably we're maybe getting close to it not existing anymore, but you might be able to find some places still running Windows 2000 today. It was that popular of an operating system. But the thing that NT suffered from for years and years and years and years is it didn't have driver support for consumer things like graphics cards and you know video game controllers, that kind of stuff. It was a business operating system. So you install Windows 2000 to replace Windows 98 and all your stuff breaks. People were ticked off. What was the quote upgrade to Windows 98? Uh, almost. You're officially right. But there was an operating system that came out called Windows Millennial. Melinda, Windows Millennia. Windows Millennium? I think a Millennium. Windows Millennium. So when Dell computers came out with Windows ME, they then offered you a certificate to upgrade back to Windows 98. Windows ME was a problem. <laughs> Everything broke. They, you know, it, so this was the death of DOS, was the Windows uh, uh, Millennium. It didn't get famous, right? <laughs> well, it, it got famous in the moment. You don't remember this? No. I remember going from Windows 2000 to XP. That's what I remember. Windows Millennium Edition, it was terrible, <laughs> nothing worked. But this was the catalyst that had to happen in order for the next guy to happen. Windows XP. So now we've merged the business and the consumer lines under the NT kernel. So we have the stability of the business operating system that Microsoft did make, right? 
and the driver support of the consumer operating system that was now running on 98% of everybody's computers. No matter how popular Apple wanted to say their stuff was, Windows still today <laughs> has, I'm going to round down and call it 95% market share on desktop computers. They'll never lose the desktop computer market share. What will happen is desktop computers will be replaced by mobile computing. The industry will die before <laughs> they lose their, uh, uh, their lead on it. And that's fine. Okay, so... From Windows XP, then we had Windows 7, and then we had we had like, you know the Windows Server line. So those were distributions still running on top of Windows NT, tuned for server applications. You know, going to be on for months and months and months at a time, and things like that. And it had some pre-installed stuff in the distribution that was server management type stuff, um, but it was still running on top of Windows NT. But on the consumer side, we had Windows 7, um, then we had Windows 10, um, Windows 7, well, Windows XP was incredibly popular. Windows 7, I think, has been, was very popular. Windows 10 was a little rough at the beginning. Vista kind of not so great in the middle there, but uh, Windows 10, I think, is becoming relatively well accepted at this point. I don't think we're quite where 7 was, but fast forward three or four years, we'll probably be fine. Um, but that's kind of our lineage. But the punchline here is, is that Ultimately, today, did I, did I lose it? Oh, there we go. I see it now. Windows runs on top of the Windows, well, not the Windows, runs on top of the NT kernel. That's the name of the actual operating system. All right. What's the actual operating system that Mac runs on top of? You basically said it yourself earlier. Linux, uh, Mac OS runs on top of Unix. It's based on uh, BSD Unix. Came out of uh, University of California, Berkeley. Um, see, that's another funny story. Uh, how many of you have been Mac users for a long time? See a couple people in here with. Uh, what was the? Fir how many of you ever used Mac OS seven? OS eight, OS nine. Don't do that. Okay, so you were you were running one of the cats, right? <laughs> okay, so uh, um, anybody run any version of Macintosh operating system prior to um, one of the Mac OS X's, one of the cats? Well, we had a Mac in the early nineties. Okay. Yeah. Sure. Yeah, you were running OS six or something like that. Yeah, something prior to the uh, the X's. Good. That's where we're going with this. So. We're going to call this guy today Mac OS. Oh man, we're, yeah, we're, just, okay, we're going to keep going. This is good stuff. This is more related to IT stuff anyways, so we'll just catch up on the back end with crazy stuff. Um, okay, so today's Mac OS is running on top of Unix. Um, So we had Mac OS, I'll just start with six. Then we had Mac OS seven and Mac OS eight and Mac OS nine. All right, now let's see if you ever experienced uh, something on one of your old Macs. Did you ever come to the machine at some point and you uh, sat down and the mouse moved? The screen was on, but it was like noon, but the clock said 2 a.m. The Mac would always crash funny. The OS would die, but the, the mouse system would still work. So you would find out the timestamp of when your machine crashed, because the clock would still say 2 a.m. or whatever, but you could still move the mouse around and things like that. It was just, the Mac OS was garbage. Um, now, what's funny is if you've ever talked to an Apple person, basically they can do no wrong, right? Apple is the best thing since sliced bread. Uh, these machines back then were also running a different, whole different processor, right? What kind of hardware was uh, Mac computers back then running? Motorola. Motorola PowerPC processors, right? IBM also made the chips. Um, 
Today, what's inside your laptop? Uh, Intel. Intel. Her laptop's Intel. Your laptop's Intel or maybe AMD, but it's a gaming machine, so I'm thinking it's Intel. Um, so every machine you see now is running something Intel or compatible, or if it's a phone, it's running an ARM processor, right? PowerPC is gone. It's dead, right? That was supposed to be the greatest thing ever. Now, all of these things are based on top of PowerPC. Now, why did Apple use PowerPC instead of Intel? The answer is obvious. Uh, there, there, I don't know if that's true. There might be, there could be truth to that. I don't want to shoot that down because I don't know that's the case, but I don't think that's the reality. At least not the driving force. Um, actually, I think it was more expensive. They just wanted to not do the same thing Microsoft did. Right? We see that the language. Later on, we're going to get to this comparison of modern languages. And right up here, I'll show you. When Microsoft went C++, Apple won Objective-C. We're not adopting the same language as they are. Mm -mm. Even at the BIOS level, they don't agree. Right? Back then, Macs would not boot off of USB. Windows would. Macs would boot off of Firewire. Windows wouldn't. They can't, they could never agree with each other. This is kind of a hilarious lineage. Okay. Now, what's interesting here is, is that all of these operating systems supported something called preemptive multitasking. So if you had a Mac back then in the early days of the internet, let's say. So early 90s is actually predating a little bit of uh, um, early days of the internet, probably around 94, 95 is when you started having like your... 9600 baud modems when dial up became sort of kind of a thing. Um, but what you would happen is, let's say you started downloading something on a Mac, you know, something like Mac OS 9, which was the latest before they killed it off. Um, you would have some file downloading and it would be downloading at what you would consider high speed back then. And then you would open up, you know, your, uh, your uh, word processor or something like that to work on a paper and you'd come back to, your che to check your download two hours later, and it basically hadn't progressed because it was given just enough CPU time to keep the application alive, but not to actually function. The application was preempted by the application that was running in the foreground. So yes, you could have more than one application, quote, running at the same time, but, <laughs> Only one of them was actually running. All right, so we're gonna call that bad multitasking. All right, um, now right around in this zone here, uh, something major happened at Apple. How many of you heard of Steve Jobs? All right, well, what did Apple do to Steve Jobs? They fired him from his own company. Hey, this is after they, he brought in the CEO from Pepsi, right? And the way Steve Jobs got him to come over, you see, anybody know the quote? How did he get the CEO of Pepsi to quit, quit Pepsi and come over to uh, run Apple? Do you want to sell sugar water the rest of your life, or do you want to change the world? Quote. All right, so um, guy comes over there, six months later, convinces Apple's board to fire Steve Jobs. Because he's a lunatic. That's okay. That's a truth. I mean, I think sometimes, and we got to sit back, and you know, have you ever heard the phrase, never meet your heroes? You heard that phrase before? I mean, there are people that, you know, to be, to change the world, like a Bill Gates or a Steve Jobs, or, you know, pick your favorite person throughout history that's done something amazing. To have that level of genius, something else probably had to give, right? You know, you read some of the biographies, and I mean, Steve Jobs was fairly open about it late in life. I mean, the guy wasn't that great of a dad and all this stuff because he had, he did that. He did what he did. Um, you know, and there's trade-offs, there's regrets, but we wouldn't have the world we have today without some of these people, right? Um, but he was a crazy person. He was overworking their employees. He demanded perfection. And it's really what made Apple what Apple was. So after they fired Steve Jobs, what, what happened? What happened to Apple? Did they immediately go to amazing successes? Amazing successes. 
We have the almost failed as a company. Uh, what does it mean for something to be proprietary? What does proprietary mean? Closed source. Let's call it the opposite of open source. Closed source, right? Nobody else is allowed to touch it. It's ours. You know, it's our secret sauce. Apple has always been a proprietary company, right? Their software runs on their own hardware. They control both sides of the coin. No wonder iOS just works, right? They have to make their operating system run on exactly six phones. Well, realistically, they have to make it run on three phones because they make you go buy the new one, right? But you get the point. Same thing with the hardware. You know, their operating system has to run on, you know, a collection of some MacBooks and a collection of some iMacs. What does, what does Windows have to run on? Four million different configurations of hardware built by zillions of different companies all over the world. It's pretty amazing how well Windows works when you consider that, isn't it? Um, so, you know, with that stuff in mind, Apple, his, its secret sauce was that they were proprietary. Their secret sauce is that they're expensive. Can Apple go budget pleaser and start selling their laptops at the same price as like HP and Dell and succeed? Apple is a premium product. It's no different than going and buying a Cadillac or a Porsche or, you know, something like that. Part of the mystique is the cost, right? You know, it's, 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 it's what Apple, you know, kind of built itself on. Well, when Steve Jobs was fired, Apple thought, oh, well, we need to compete with Microsoft, who's running the world. So they decided to start allowing third-party vendors to build hardware that their software would run on. They almost fell apart as a company. So, did they hire Steve Jobs back? What did Steve Jobs do when he left Apple? Oh, that is something he did. Yeah, a little company, bought Pixar. Probably haven't heard of it, right? Yeah. Yeah, I think he bought it for $7 million. Years later, sold it for $8 billion to Disney and still ran the board. Yeah, Toy Story Pixar. Yeah, that one, little company. Yeah, he bought that as a hobby when he was, uh, actually bought it from George Lucas, Star Wars guy. He was going through a bad divorce at the time. <laughs> Needed to unload a couple of companies. <laughs> you know, usually history is funnier than, <laughs> than re you know, reality is funnier than, uh, you know, made up jokes. Uh, what else did he do? There was something really, really, really important that Steve Jobs did that most of us don't know. Look at that picture right there. See that picture? Steve Jobs, Next Computers, created a company called Next Computers. It was both Mac, Windows, and Unix compatible. Now, a couple years later, they were really, really expensive. Universities kind of bought into them a little bit for a period of time. Now, because most of you have not heard of Next Computers, right? Okay. Um, Although I guarantee all of you have heard of it. You just get distracted by the Apple logo that's sitting on, sitting on it. So years later, as Apple was failing as a company, they acquired Next Computers to save face by not having to rehire Steve Jobs. When you acquire a company, its personnel come with the company. So Steve Jobs, came back to Apple as part of the acquisition of Next Computers from Apple. And um, uh, they uh, installed him as the interim CEO, which later got, you know, uh, the I CEO. So what did Steve Jobs do when he came back from, uh, came back to Apple? iPod, iMac, iBook, that was their laptop. That one didn't even work out. Um, iPad, iPhone, the i everything. 
Made a couple of bucks with those guys. Okay. Something else he did. He came out with something called OSX. Question here is, what does the X stand for? Is it X as in 10? 9 goes to 10. Is it the X as in Unix? Now, if I go up here, and I say about this Mac, and I look at the version, so my version number for my OS is 10.15.2. So if this is OS 10, version 15, you know, now we're on to, you know, what is this, Catalina? We ran out of cats. Um, you know, that was funny. Their last, uh, before they uh, released, what was it, Mavericks was the first non-cat OS. If you watch the keynote for, um, uh, let's see if they, we could bring up the picture. It was pretty funny. OS X, they said, we're starting to run out of cat names. And on Apple Slides, uh, on the slide they had in their show, they had OSX Sea Lion. <laughs> like maybe they would name their, this is actually from their keynote. You know, basically saying, okay, we've run out of cat names and we thought about going with Sea Lion. Yeah, so this, is, this isn't like a mock-up. This was on Apple's keynote presentation. Um, you know, I actually had another one where it had like a beach ball. <laughs> it was bouncing it. Um, but in any case, that's when they went to Mavericks and stuff like that. But punchline here is, is that um, regardless of whether it stands for the X in Unix or the uh, um, uh, 10, we had a problem. It definitely is based on top of Unix, where OS 9 was not. So this guy was supposed to be a game changer. Apple dodged two major, major, major bullets during this period of time. The first one is, and this is... This is, I don't think they would have survived this without a cult following. People were so supportive. Of, if you're already a Mac user, you're already drinking the Kool-Aid, you'll just stick with Apple forever, right? When you upgraded from OS 9 to OS X, none of your applications would work. Because all of your applications were compiled for the OS 9 operating system on the PowerPC architecture. OS X is not based off of OS 9. It's based off of Unix. None of your applications that you ran yesterday were built for this operating system. It's like trying to install a Mac version of something on Windows. It's a whole different operating system. And what happened is the companies that you know, were like the flagship companies that made Apple software, third-party software, they were behind the release date. So they didn't have new versions of like even web browsers available for OS X native. Instead, Apple shipped with a virtual machine. We're gonna talk about virtual machines today when we start looking at the Linux stuff, but it shipped with a virtual machine called, anybody know what the virtual machine was called? called Blue Box. So inside of Mac OS X, you ran OS 9 as part of, I mean, you were using your system resources to run OS X, and then you were giving up some of those system resources to run OS 9 as a virtual machine so that you can run the same applications as you were able to run natively yesterday. For like six or eight months, People were, were virtualizing their operating system just so they could keep running stuff. Okay. Now, what happens is finally software starts uh, getting becoming available. You're, you're you know, kind of weaning yourself off the blue box, right? You're, you're no longer having to emulate half your operating system and you're able to run applications natively. Uh, then what happens? Apple does another major, major, major change. They switched to Intel, right? Macs today have Intel inside of them. So they dumped PowerPC. This was after the G4 processors came out. So we had the G2, G3, G4 processors. 
G4 had a technology in it called Altebec, uh, which was you know, supposed to be, it's kind of the precursor to hyper-threading that's inside of Intel processors today. Um, but they came out, they switched over to Intel processors, and uh, the, uh, uh, now you have Mac OS X made for Intel, but none of your software will run on that either. Because it was compiled for the software, it was compiled for my uh, OS X, but not for your architecture, for Intel. So now we gotta play this game again. They survived it again. Twice, two times they dodged that bullet. Now what happened to next computers? So here's some documentation for uh, current libraries for Mac OS X programming. Uh, so notice this is developer.apple.com. Um, this is our foundation library. If you want to write software for it, this is how strings are defined. Next step string. Apple computer today is next computers with an Apple logo on it. Apple died. What you have sitting in front of you is a Next computer with an Apple logo sitting on it. We're seeing it right there at the software level. To this day, you still use NS strings. Next step everything. The core object for all these things is a Next step object. Any of you know that story? First you've heard of it? Sell all your Apple stock. <laughs> yeah, very fascinating um, uh, how some of these things kind of came together. And Apple's greatest weakness, being it was proprietary, ended up being its greatest strength. Apple is not Microsoft. Apple is not Google. Apple doesn't have its identity without being expensive proprietary and exclusive, right? They're not Apple otherwise. They don't know how to, I mean, that's really, we might say, why they're maybe having some hiccups right now. You know, since Steve Jobs passed, he, we have people in charge at Apple that are Steve Jobs-esque. You know, they kind of came under his wing and, you know, but they're not as crazy as him. Yeah, they're not him. They're not pushing the envelope. They're not having these what I can only imagine are, you know, demeaning arguments behind the scenes and, you know, throwing the brand new piece of equipment out the window and saying, go and start this over. I need it tomorrow. Because um, he did that, you know, so it's, it's really interesting how things drove to where it is today. Um, okay, so that gets us to our modern operating systems on the Mac and the Windows side. And we kind of see how these guys have evolved. All right, so let's take about a 10 minute break and then we'll come back and we'll start talking about Linux and dive into programming. Sound good? So let's see, let's come back at 722.